Uh, so like I said, we've got Jeff here tonight. Anyone who doesn't know Jeff, um, he's the leading Agile coach in the UK, very well known. Um, Jeff and Paul Goddard are organisers of the Global Scrum, Scrum Gathering in London based this year, so I definitely recommend you have a look at that. That's, we're, we're lucky to be hosting that in the UK, which is great, and, and I'm sure Jeff is giving his time for free to organise that, so that takes a lot of effort. Um, also very grateful that he's come here tonight. Um, it's, you know, we, as user groups, we, we do really well from coaches giving their own time. Uh, and they're busy schedules, they're, you know, they're all over the place, these guys. And they take the effort to come along and uh, provide us with some training, which is fantastic. So please give a round of applause to Jim. Thanks, Nigel. Evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Very good, very good. Here in the front row, in the splash zone. <laughs> yeah, verbal. Yeah, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm here to talk to you about coaching for change. So I do a lot of different types of coaching in my life. I do some sports coaching for kids. I do some leadership coaching uh, and I do some agile coaching. And while they're all different, they all have similarities. They all have common threads. And one of the questions that I get asked quite a lot in my job is, well, a lot of questions start with the same few words, which is how do I get so-and-so to do something. All right. Now, I generally operate on the premise that I can't change anybody else. I can't get anyone to do anything. I've, I've got a 15 year old daughter now, so this is really true for me now. Okay. <laughs> Better get her out of bed in the morning. So I operate on the principle that you can't change other people. You can change yourself though, and you can change the environment which will allow others to change how they think. And that's a key part of coaching. So I'm talking to you today a little bit about some of the psychology underpinning coaching for others for change, um, how you can perhaps use some techniques to help you help other people, and uh, a little bit of a model that I've come up with, which I use in my daily work. Uh, I will say, however, I came across this phrase recently, all models are wrong, but some can be useful. And I'll say that even about my own model. All right. It's probably not right, but it might be useful to you. So if anything you see like that, just take it and think, well, is this useful to me uh, or is it not? Um, before we get into that, though, I've got a little bit of maths for you. I know it's, what, it's just gone half seven on a Thursday. No one really likes maths and algebra and things this, kind of, this time of night. Uh, if you do, you probably wouldn't be here. But uh, very simple maths. And this is about the, the sort of unconscious assessment that I believe that we all go through when thinking about doing something differently, whether, it could, whether it's about um, joining a new team or starting a new hobby or even you know, buying a new gadget for the house or whatever. Anything that we're thinking of doing that's changing our current status quo, I believe that we all go through a mental assessment of that decision some more conscious than others. And I represent that assessment by this formula here. I call it Jeff's change equation because, well, I've got an ego. Uh, and so what this is representing is that the benefit of that change, whatever it is that's going to do for us, that should give us some benefit. All right? Otherwise, we probably just wouldn't even think about it. However, there's a chance that whatever we're going to try doesn't work out. All right, perhaps I try joining this new team and they don't accept me. Or it's not kind of what I was hoping for. Or uh, I think I'm going to go on a fitness regime, or I'm going to try dry, dry January, and it do I don't make it to the end. There's a chance that I don't see it through, it doesn't work out. So the probability of success is, is tied to that benefit. And because there is a chance that it doesn't work, always, when you multiply those two together, the benefit always reduces. It's Bear with me on the math side of things. But basically, the benefit times the, the probability of success is on one side of the equation. And on the other side of the equation is the cost of that change to the individual. Now, that could be financial cost. It could be uh, emotional cost. It could be physical cost. You know, if I'm, if I'm uh, doing dry January, I, I've perhaps got to turn down invites to the pub from my friends, or I've got to turn up and drink soft drinks, which I don't really like. Uh, if I'm trying to get fit, I've, you know, I've got to get out of bed on a cold, wet morning, 
and go for a run. This is, this is, this is an investment on my part. There's, there's something that I have to invest in this. And what I'm saying is that for anybody to do anything differently, this side of the equation needs to outweigh that side of the equation. Because if it doesn't, we just wouldn't do it. It wouldn't be a return on investment for us as an individual. And it doesn't just have to just outweigh the cost. It has to significantly outweigh the cost. Because when given a choice, people will typically stay where they are. Better the devil you know. All right. This is, economists refer to this as the endowment effect. Um, and what they mean by the endowment effect is basically we, we, we value what we have more than we should. All right. So if, and uh, the easiest way to explain this is if I, if I was to give you a hundred pounds, Nigel, you'd be happy, I would imagine. Yeah? yeah, you'd be happy. Uh, if we put a number on that happiness, maybe we'd call it 10. All right. You, you'd gone up by 10 units of happiness. However, if you had a hundred pounds and I took that hundred pounds away from you, you would be unhappy. Is that fair? True. For most people, the amount of unhappiness from losing £100 is more than the amount of happiness they get from gaining £100. We're loss averse as human beings. We put a greater value on something just because we have it. Okay, now that can be a physical item, it could be money, or it could be a behaviour, or it could be a value or a belief. Anything that's part of our way of viewing the world, we own, it's part of us, we have a greater attachment to than something that we don't. So it has to considerably outweigh the cost of doing something. Now, bearing that in mind, I think we can probably attack that, that change equation in a couple of different areas. Either we can try maximising the benefit, we can try reducing the cost, we can try increasing the probability of change. Any of those variables will change that, that formula, hopefully for the positive. And this is where I, I overlay that change equation with this model that I've come up with. This is where the noodles come in. So the Raman model, um, mainly because it was the only word we could make up from the letters at the start of the model. Uh, and and it's, it sort of made sense, although noodles don't really make any sense. Um, maybe over time we'll, we'll make it sexier and we'll come up with a better name. But um, the elements of this Raman model are starting in the middle. Empathy and neutrality. So what, first of all, I was positioning this as something that I would like to do. But the title of this talk is Coaching for Change. So you're now with, from the eyes of a coach thinking, how can I help other people change? Perhaps I want, I want my development team. How can I get my development team to try pair programming? Or how can I get management to, to really buy into the culture of, of Agile? Or how can I get my product owner to really get his product backlog in, in, in order or something like this? So you're thinking about how can I help other people do this? And starting in the centre there with regards to empathy and neutrality, this is, I believe, Jeff believes, not proven anywhere really, <coughs> that if you're going to be an effective coach, then you have to be able to empathise with the person you're coaching. Even if you don't necessarily agree with their point of view, you have to be able to see it. You have to be able to understand that what is true for them is valid for them, even if you have a different view of reality. And then this sense of neutrality, the fact that I don't have an ulterior motive. It's not about me manipulating you to my agenda. All right. So those are two things that I think is really important in terms of establishing that relationship so that you can then help them work out whether this is worthwhile for them and whether they can go about getting there. If we work on that, if we've got that fundamentals in place, then we can start looking at how we could reduce the concerns or reduce the costs of this change, perhaps amplify the benefits of this change, and then finally modelling the change ourselves, which is a little bit of like walking the talk uh, and, uh, and living, living the values that we're espousing. I'm going to give you an example here of, of how we use this model, how I use this model. And some of you will be familiar with the Agile podcast. Some of you will have better things to do with your time, quite frankly. Um, but uh, about 18 months ago, I had an idea about going to a pub with a dictaphone, with a friend, talking about stuff, recording it, and sticking it on iTunes. And I said to Paul, Paul Goddard, I said, I've got this idea about this going to a pub and just talking and recording it and sticking it on iTunes. And he said, oh, I don't know, Jeff. It um, sounds a bit weird. Who would listen to that kind of nonsense? And so I had to try and coach him to change his mind. All right. So I'm going to walk you through this Raman model in this, in this aspect. Now, the good news is 
we had a bit of history, Paul and I. We've worked together for you know, close to 15 years now. Um, and we've got a certain amount of respect for one another and empathy with one another, rapport with one another. And that, that empathy was already there. So that was a good start. However, the neutrality wasn't there because he automatically knew this was my idea. All right? And I was trying to convince him round to my point of view. So trying to reduce that neutrality about being open-minded about the outcome, effectively being able to say, I had an idea, but I'm open to the fact that it might not work. I'm not attached to it, but let's explore it. And being able to put that, effectively, my cards on the table and Paul being able to say, fair enough, I know you're not going to try and bully me into this, allowed us to have that open conversation about it. Uh, but I was coaching someone a while ago who, um, who, who came to me and they said they've got a reputation in their organisation as the scrum bully. This was the term that they, they, they used. That's the label that they'd been given, the scrum bully. And I said, well, how did you get that label? I said, well, because I'm so passionate about it. I really genuinely believe that Agile is a good thing and scrum is a good thing. I go around talking to people. You know, I can't understand why they're not doing this stuff so I sort of get really and before I know it I'm telling them where they're going wrong and just telling them why they're idiots if they don't do this and it, I don't mean to do that but I'm just so passionate about it and they've lost that sense of neutrality now once we lose that sense of neutrality we're impinging on someone's autonomy their ability to own their own fate now we're funny as human beings we're quite weird in many ways one of the ways we're weird is that if we feel that somebody's trying to get us to do something, even if it's good for us, we'll resist it because it's them trying to make us do something. It's impinging on our autonomy as human beings. If we'd have come up with the idea ourselves, we might go for it. But if somebody's trying to force us to do it or shadily manipulate us to do it, then we'll, we'll sabotage it. So getting that sense of neutrality is, is really important there. And that's quite hard for a, for a scrum master, for an agile coach, whose job role it is to agilify the organization or make the team be more agile. Uh, so what can we do about that? Well, first of all, we can, what we say, meet them where they are. So accept their reality. Understand the situation that they're in. I can understand why Paul would have concerns about this. Right? I can understand why he'd be wary about it. I can understand the fact that um, he's past, you know, he's, he knows me. He's seen me come up with silly ideas in the past and some of them haven't worked. Right? So I can get that. And the fact that I can put myself in his shoes metaphorically builds that sense of neutrality, builds that sense of empathy. So meeting them where they are, their reality is true to them, it's valid for them. Establish that objectivity, being able to take the personal opinion away from things and listen without judgment. Listen to what that person is telling you about their situation without judging it, without interrupting it, without trying to argue with them, but just genuinely hearing what they have to say. All establishes the empathy and neutrality. And if you can play back what you've heard without what we call discounting, without putting your filter on it. Play it back as pure as you possibly can. Literally repeating what they've said to you shows that you've heard them. You haven't taken what they've said, translated it into your world and played it back from your perspective. That builds that sense of neutrality, that they don't have to worry about you manipulating their words. So those are all things that we can do perhaps to increase the sense of empathy and neutrality. And once we have it, all right. There's another aspect to coaching which fits into this, which we call unconditional positive regard. Now, this comes from professional coaching rather than agile coaching. And it stems from a guy called Goethe. Uh, and this, this famous quote by this, this guy, this um, philosopher and, and therapist called Goethe, says, if we treat a man as he is, we make him less than he is. If we treat a man as though he already were what he potentially could be, we make him what he should be. Now, what that's effectively saying is we believe in the unlimited capacity and potential of the person that we're coaching. We genuinely believe that they have good intentions, that they have capacity to be great and potential to be great. Now, if you can demonstrate that belief in the person you're coaching, you're halfway there. Okay. If you don't, you haven't got that relationship to build on. You haven't got the permission to coach. All right. So scrum masters, agile coaches, even product owners to a degree and leaders in an organization have to work on developing that permission to coach. You don't, need necessar you don't necessarily need permission to manage somebody, 
but you do need permission to coach somebody. And a friend of mine, Esther Derby, she said, don't go around inflicting your help on people. Right. I thought it was pretty wise words. I don't think I've ever heard Esther say anything that wasn't wise, to be fair, but uh, particularly wise words. Um, so other things that we can do, what's happening here? It's a little bit out of date now, this two heads of state no longer there, but what's happening here from a, from a psychologist's point of view, what would you say? Mirroring. Mirroring, yes. So, so mirroring, matching, things like that. Copying the body language, copying the posture of other people builds that sense of rapport. Um, it, it can be quite natural, uh, but it does, it's not always natural. Yeah? You can take it too far, <laughs> all right? And if you take it too far, then it genuinely seems like you're manipulating the situation, you're taking the taking the mick a little bit um, but a little bit of mirroring a little bit of matching is a powerful thing psychologically for people there's this sense that we, we like people who we think are like us all right so if we have similar things in common similar traits similar postures similar body language similar clothes things like that that can help just establish that sense of of rapport um, interestingly I said about listening without judgment and playing back um, I quite like the old scientific experiment now and again and this one was done by a guy called Cialdini, whose work's very interesting, if, if, you, if you like this kind of thing, about influencing and how people think and uh, how decisions are made and things like that. They studied wait waiters and waitresses in American restaurants and how much they got tipped. And they found that if you, the waiters and waitresses who repeated back what the people had ordered verbally, rather than writing it down on a pad, no pad, no writing, just verbally repeated back, those people got 70% more tips than the waiters and waitresses who wrote the stuff down. Those people in the restaurant, they, were fe they felt listened to. That being listened to is kind of a gift. And we have this idea of reciprocity as humans. If one person gives you a gift, you kind of give one back. Yeah? Now, it's not a physical gift, like at Christmas, but it's a gift of being listened to, being heard, being respected. And then is a kind of, well, what can I do to repay that? Well, I can give you a tip. It doesn't, it's not a conscious thought process but it's something that's going on there. You listen to them, we build rapport. Once we've got that rapport, we can start working on reducing the concerns. There will be concerns with everything. There will be costs to everything. Paul had valid costs, valid concerns. He thought it wouldn't be professional. Yeah? He thought, you know, I've got a professional image to maintain here. If my clients hear any of this nonsense talking in a pub, I might not get a gig again. He said, um, we, we might have nothing to talk about. All right? we just, the conversation might just dry up might get there and freeze. Um, and even if we did find something to talk about, people might not be interested in it. It might be boring. No one might download it. Well, they might download it and tweet about how terrible it is. He was worried about all these things. And I can understand all of those things. All right. So we reduce those concerns. Well, what can we, first of all, we can name them. Okay. One thing we find with human beings is the longer we leave things in our head, the more our fears and our concerns inflate. We catastrophize. All right. But just sometimes, simply by listing out the things that we're worried about, we can realise, actually, they're not, it's not, not as many as I thought they were. And actually, once I see them on paper, they don't seem quite as scary as when they were in my head. So just naming them can be a good start. Um, and again, this without judgement. So if it's a concern for that person, even if you wouldn't consider it a concern, it is a valid concern. Once we've named them, we can objectively assess them. We can look at them with objective eyes on a piece of paper and say, all right, how likely is it that that's going to happen? And if it did happen, how bad would it actually be? We could do that. We can analyse any assumptions that are underpinning them. All right, so where are these concerns coming from? And is there something that we can do to address this underpinning factor rather than just scratch the, uh, the, the, the symptom? And maybe we could reduce them. Once we see them there, we've analysed them, we've objectively assessed them. Maybe we could just reduce them slightly. But getting them out there is the first thing. Now, there's an another psychological concept here from the world of psychology called the locus of control. Is anybody familiar with the term locus of control? It's a bit of a, a, bit of a fancy term, really, for what it is. Um, it's to do with how much you view yourself as having control over your own destiny. So we don't talk about having a locus of control or not having a locus of control. We talk about either having an internal locus of control or an external locus of control. Um, and I'll illustrate this with, with a very brief um, example. 
And so I'm going to give you a few statements. And I want you to think about those statements. I'm not going to ask you to shout these out or share them with anybody. Just in your head, think about how, you, how much you agree with these statements. Okay, so when you see the statement, if you think, yes, that sums me up, right? Absolutely, nailed that, that's me. Then you would score one, all right? If you think, yeah, that's, that's probably more me than not me, I would agree with that slightly, two points. If you would disagree with it, but only just, three points. And if you think that's the opposite of me, I really disagree with that statement. That doesn't sum me up at all. Four points. Okay. There'll only be a few statements. Again, a little bit of mental arithmetic, just adding up a few numbers in your head. Don't worry. We're not going to test you on it. Uh, so the first statement then, most of what happens in life is controlled by forces that we don't understand and are outside of our control. Right. If you think that's, yeah, I agree with that statement strongly. Most of what happens in life is controlled by forces we don't understand and are outside of our control. You would strongly agree you'd give yourself one point there in your head. If you think, no, that's, that's completely wrong. I really disagree with that. It would be a four. Okay. Second statement, success hinges on being in the right place at the right time. Yeah, that's, that's how success happens, by being in the right place at the right time. If you think, yeah, a little bit, two points. Yeah. And then you'd add that number to your first number. So you've now still got one number in your head, just slightly bigger than it was before. Third statement, whether I work hard or not, it won't affect how people assess my performance. People still make their own mind up anyway, regardless of whether I work hard. Okay. Again, if you strongly disagree with that statement, you give yourself four. All right. Add that to the number that you had before, slightly bigger number now. And the next statement, leaders are born and not made. Leaders are born, not made. Okay. Give yourself that number, add it to the number in your head. You've now got a slightly bigger number. This is obviously a very scratch the surface uh, introduction to the locus of control. But if you scored somewhere in the region of four to seven, then you'd, you'd have what we call an external locus of control. Right? That means that you believe stuff happens outside. You don't really have much of a control over things. Fate plays a bigger part. Luck plays a bigger part. Other people play a bigger part in what happens to you and you don't really believe you have much control over your destiny. <coughs> high scores, um, a high internal locus of control. That means that I'm, I believe I do have control over what happens to me. Yeah. My actions make a difference. So why do we talk about this? Why do you think I've brought this into, into this conversation about coaching for change? What's this got to do with coaching people, do you think? It's a big part of it. Yeah, we have to, whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, we are going to make a decision about whether we, whether we do something or not. If we have a high external locus of control, we generally feel apathetic. We feel, what's the point? Fate's going to do what fate's going to do. Right. And putting ourselves out there is a risk. That probability of success in that change equation is almost always significantly lower for people with a high external locus of control. You ever see cynical people? Think, What's the point? I've seen it all before. Management's just going to torpedo it. You know? Or we might do this, but then so-and-so won't bother turning up. These kinds of things. An external locus of control. The more we can develop an internal locus of control, the more likely we are to be successful at change. So as a coach thinking, well, first of all, can we give people an awareness of what type of locus of control they currently have as their default and how well that's working for them? And would they like to increase their internal sense of locus of control? Um, another exercise that I quite like in this area with regards to reducing the cost of change is fear setting. And this is taken from a, a guy called Tim Ferriss. Is it? There's a YouTube video out there you can, you can watch. Um, beware, it, it's slightly dark in places. Viewer discretion is, is slightly um, advised. Um, but, and I've, I've sort of taken this and, and changed it a little bit. But the basic premise of fear setting is, first of all, naming your concerns, just like we said already. So what's the absolute worst that could happen if I did what I'm thinking of? List them out. In a, in a sort of table format. And then what steps can I take for each of those concerns that would reduce the chances of that coming to fruition, even just by a little bit? 
right? so a kind of risk mitigation plan. So with Paul, for example, he's worried that um, he's worried that it won't be considered professional. Okay, well we we don't have to stream it, all right? We could we could vet it. We could ask a, an independent third party to listen to it before we submitted it to iTunes. That would reduce the concern slightly. All right. What could we do, this is the third column, what could we do to get back to where I am now if it happens? What's my recovery plan, if you like? So if the worst does happen, how could I recover the situation, a contingency plan? So let's say we put, a, we put, a, we put an episode out there. Somebody out there thinks that's unprofessional and Paul loses a piece of work out of it. That's the worst that could happen. You think it comes true, what could we do about it? Well, we could delete it. We could delete the episode. Pretend it never happened. All right. We're in control of our iTunes account. We can take it down. Uh, and just by listing these things out, what is it? How could we reduce that a little bit? What's our backup plan if it does happen? It enables us to reduce that C of the equation slightly. So it makes it a little bit easier for us. Then we can go to work on the good stuff, the benefits. All right. Why we should think, that, why we should do this? You know, why is this a good idea in the first place? These types of questions. Do we have ownership? That excellent point there of uh, making the decision ourselves. That sense of ownership means we're more likely to see the benefit of it rather than it being forced upon us or feeling manipulated into something. So we perhaps work on that ownership of the idea. What's the big picture? Not just what's the, what's, why is this a good idea, but how does this fit into our bigger picture, our bigger goals, our, our, our goals as a, as a person, our career goals perhaps? How does this help us towards where we ultimately want to be? Think even bigger. And then how does it map to our personal values? All these things can help us just realize how much of a good idea it is. It's not changing the idea itself, it's just helping us see the bits that we might not be seeing when just looking at the words. All right, so um, what do we see when we look in the mirror, basically? Where's Phil? Where's, my, where's Phil gone? Oh, there you are. No, where's Phil gone? He's gone. I was talking to Phil a minute ago, and uh, he was putting himself down about his uh, AV capabilities. And he was getting a bit of stick from somebody else, a bit of teasing. Um, but quite often we, we do underestimate what we see in the mirror. We, we play down our capabilities. It's kind, of, it's kind of the British thing to do, isn't it, really? Self-deprecatory. Right. But why is this a good idea? Can we give ourselves enough space to actually give ourselves credit for the ideas that we come up with and the value in them, rather than just seeing all the problems in them? Uh, a coach can help you do that. Uh, that sense of ownership... All right, so if it's their idea, more likely to be beneficial, more likely to mean something to them, more likely to see it through when it gets difficult. So as a coach, making sure that, and it's very difficult, it's very difficult to avoid putting suggestions forward to help. Why don't you try this? Why don't you think of that? But it's got to stay their idea for it to be beneficial to that person. Um, and then we call the Goldilocks tasks. Not too hard, not too easy, just right. And as a coach, we can help them break things down into smaller manageable chunks or make something that feels meaningless a little bit bigger. So it's, it's challenging enough. Not too daunting, but not too boring. Um, I'll introduce you to a friend of the family, uh, Cora. She's a little bit older than this now, um, but she's a very good swimmer. And you can see there with all her medals. And... Um, I said to her one day, do you like swimming? And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I grow up, I want to be an Olympic swimmer. I want to swim at the Olympics. I want to win gold medals. I said, that's, that's pretty good. At nine, it's quite, quite a good, good thing. And then she followed it up with, because then I can get on Strictly. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, it. that's an interesting way of viewing the world. Uh, put all this training in, all those hours, win the races, just so you can get on Strictly. Uh, but this, is, this made me think about intrinsic and extrinsic motivators. You know, why do we do things? Do we do things for the instant reward? Do we do things for what people will think of us? Do we do things because that's what we want to do? That's the kind of thing that we believe we are as a person. Uh, and the more we can get in touch with the intrinsic motivators, that, that internal value alignment, the more likely these, these successes are to be more meaningful and more worth investing our time in. 
Uh, very easy to focus on the superficial. Another example, um, I went to, I had, well, I had to, I went to give a talk um, somewhere in, in the States a couple of years ago. And um, for whatever reason, I, I messed my travel up. All right, so I flew into somewhere like Atlanta and I had to drive to Dallas or something. It was like a seven hour drive. And I thought, I just had a eight hour, nine hour flight and I had to get in a car and drive for seven hours. And I thought, oh, that's not, that's not good. But when I got to the car rental place, they said, and here's your car, Mr. Watts. And I thought, I get to drive for seven hours in this? Brilliant. It had gone from, I have to get through this, to this is going to be cool. I don't want this to stop. An intrinsic motivator. And I thought, well, how can we use that in other ways? I'm going to introduce you to my son, Cody. Again, he's a little bit older than this now, but a couple of years ago, we were struggling with getting him to, to read. Right, do, his, do his homework and reading. It was boring for him. He just wanted to come home and sort of play some games and you know, watch some TV and go to bed. He didn't want to have to read. Um, so what could we do? How could we, how could we go about changing that behavior? Well, I have to admit, you know, I'm not the world's best parent. So my first instinct was to bribe him. All right? read, read, read your story, give you some sweets. All right? Which probably does have short-term results. Okay, but that's actually reducing any kind of value, any kind of enjoyment that he gets from the task. He's just focused on the sweets. And now he's never going to read unless he gets sweets. All right, so I've, I've made a short-term gain, but I've ruined everything if I do that. Okay, so I think, right, well, that's just an extrinsic motivator. That's not a good thing. What about an intrinsic motivator? So I could say to him, right, Cody, if you don't read, okay, you won't do very well at school. And if you don't do very well at school, you won't get into a good university. And if you don't get a good university, you won't get a good job, which means you won't get a good house, which means you won't get on a good, nice holidays. All right. And he said, Dad, I'm six. <laughs> and I thought, OK, fair enough. Yeah, you can't really imagine that far in the future. So maybe, maybe intrinsic motivator is not going to work there. Or maybe it's just a different kind of intrinsic motivator. So luckily, you, know, you have a bad cop. You have a good cop. My wife is a good parent. She knows what to do. Right, so she takes him to the, to the bookshop and says, you can have any book you want. Any book you want. So he says, what, a Star Wars book? Yeah, you can have a Star Wars book. Have a Star Wars book. Now he's reading all the time. All right. He doesn't want to go to bed. He wants to finish the book. He wants the next one. Because he's enjoying the story. He's enjoying the thing. He had control over it as well. It wasn't a book that was forced upon him by school. He could pick it. So this intrinsic and extrinsic motivator, and there, there he is. See, my view, kids, slave labor, all right? <laughs> I hate gardening. I hate it, all right? And I thought, how can I possibly get my kids to help me? All right, autumn, worst time of the year for me, leaves everywhere. Um, and my, dad, my, my, my son came out to me and said, Daddy, you don't look very happy. I said, oh, I hate gardening. Um, do you want to help me? Do you want to help me do some work? Um, I didn't quite have to go so far as to say, I'll pay you, all right? But he said, this isn't work, this is fun. All right, I said, what, what do you mean it's fun? He said, well, look, you can, uh, can I use the leaf blower? Can I use the, can I use the shovel? All right, that's, that's a terrible tool for picking up leaves. All right, that's really inefficient, all right? <laughs> terrible, but he loved it, all right? And then he was putting it in the wheelbarrow and then he was putting it in it and just driving around with it and he was enjoying it, he, was made, he made it a game. Whereas me, I saw it as work. One man's work is another man's play. Uh, basically, what I'm saying is, you know, I've got a lot to learn from my kids, and I'm still trying. So we can maximise the benefit. Maybe we can make it more enjoyable. We can tap into our intrinsic motivation, make it a game. But then, where a lot of things fall down in the organisations that I work in, is mixed messages. All right, where people say one thing, but do something else. And coaching is built built on respect, integrity. Because we can't, we don't have any authority over the people we're coaching. Or if we do, that's not what we're using. So the only thing we've got is respect and integrity and trust. And so we're constantly asking ourselves, you know, do I actually model the agile values that I'm looking for others to live? And do I say, and I see many, many managers who say, self-organize like this. Right. Don't see the irony. Um, and always thinking, I'm an actor in this scene. I'm part of what's going on here, whether I like it or not. 
Everything that you do, everything that you don't do, everything that you say, everything that you don't say as a scrum master, a product owner, a coach, a manager, any, any role, is going to affect the situation. And we don't really think about that. It's very easy to think, well, they need to do something differently. Or they should have said this. Or they shouldn't have done that. You have less control over that than you do over what you're doing. And so thinking about how am I affecting this situation is probably the best place to start for these people. Can I prove that I'm, I believe what I'm talking about? That I walk the talk? Can I make it easier for other people to follow this? Yeah. And one easy way to do that is not worrying about who gets the credit for the change. And not making people feel like I told you so if they change their mind. You see a lot of scrum masters and coaches out there who want to take the credit for making the change happen. And we can sense that. The team can sense that. It's not their change anymore. So how can we model the change? Dilbert. Yeah. Uh, I can't hire good people, so I settle for micromanaging the half wits I can afford. And your boss was saying just the same thing. Are we matching our words with our actions? Now, this is get coming back to my personal view again, because not everybody will agree with me here, but my view is the function of leadership is to produce more leaders, not more followers. Okay? I'm not doing my job as a leader if I've got millions of people following me, but if I've got lots of people in the organization who are leading themselves and leading others, that's a sign of successful leadership. So thinking everything that I'm doing, is that creating greater dependence upon me as a leader, or is it creating greater self-sufficiency? And this doesn't have to be your CEO. It can be anyone. Okay, everyone in your organization, you, everyone has a role of leadership. Leadership is not a job. It's something that we all do. Um, so and it's, it's not done with words and speeches and, and you know, memos and all hands calls and press conferences. It's, it's done by what you do. Uh, and people will notice what you do a hell of a lot more than what you say. Okay. And then finally then, do you really trust the people that you're coaching? Do you really trust the people that you're working with? Do you trust their intentions? Do you trust their potential? Do you trust their capacity? Because if you don't, that will shine through and you'll lose that integrity that you've tried to build this coaching relationship upon. You're not modeling the change. And that's all I've got for you, I'm afraid. Um, I don't know how, how, how to be on time. Not too bad. So we've got a little bit of time for some questions, if you have any, or a discussion. I'm just going to grab a sip of water. I should bring my own tumbleweed, I reckon. Just <laughs> roll it across the table. Yeah. Okay. I work for a law firm. One of our biggest challenges is that it's a big partnership, mm. and getting them to collectively buy into stuff yeah. is a huge challenge. Um, we're not particularly agile. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not so much a question, it's more just really a, a comment and okay. an observation really that a lot of what we discussed in the session today kind of emulates what you just said okay. in terms of getting people to think, uh, I'm trying to sort of emphasize with people, mm. understand what their motivators are, um, and there's a lot from that I think I can take away to one of the biggest lessons was how do we get people to come along on that journey? Yeah. Mm. They're front and centre, all the parts want to do something different on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, but then when you put someone forward, they say it's not what they wanted. Mm. Or when, when you sort of talk about the impact. So there's a lot there that's really, really interesting. Cool. Is, is it recorded? So I'm, I'm experimenting with recording. Basically, I get, I get told by lots of people, you don't record enough stuff. All right. And mainly because I don't like being recorded. But. Um, I'm bowing to a bit of pressure, so I'm, I'm, I, I, these are my cameras, and I'm going to try and edit them and see if I can do anything yeah, with them. 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 Yeah, well, the idea is if I can do it, then it'll just be posted to YouTube or something. So. Um, but you just reminded me of a phone call I had with somebody today. They rang me up, uh, and they wanted their, uh, i get this right, so they had a, 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 a chief product officer, uh, a chief technology officer, and the head of product. They wanted those three people uh, to, to go to one of my training courses. And I said, it's an interesting choice of people. Um, why? 
and she said, well, they don't get it. Yeah. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're not, they're not road mapping properly. They're not prioritizing properly. Um, you know, they think they, they know what they're doing, but it, they're not doing it properly. I said, so you want, you want me to train them in what you want them to do. How do you think that's going to go down? You know, why, why should they? What's in it for them? Why should they come along and do what somebody else is telling them to do? What would make them want to do something differently? What would make them want to roadmap? What would make them want to prioritize differently? What, why should they? And this, this, this natural response, I think it, it's, it's a cultural thing. It's a, it's a hierarchical thing. It's, it's, a, it's a legacy thing of you know, orders coming down the chain of command. And my responsibility is to make you do what I need you to do. And it just doesn't work that way. In, in large organizations now. The leadership point you mentioned, I think that's one of our biggest problems because it's very much top down and it's just, this is what we want to start about. Mm. Empowering people that are sort of lower down who are doing the work. Yeah. To actually lead it and drive it and have that trust between the two and the, the mixed messages. I mean, that was one of the big kind of things that came out of that. Mm. There's a lot of inconsistent messages between what they say we're doing and what they're actually yeah. doing. Yeah. The empathy, I'll, I'll try and link this back, because it's quite, again, it's quite easy to think, well, oh, these people are idiots. They're, they're sending out these mixed messages. But taking a little bit of time and thinking, well, if I was in there, let's assume for a minute that they're not an idiot. All right, let's assume they have a certain level of intelligence. And let's also assume that they're not trying to sabotage the organization. They don't have a personal vendetta against me. I might be wrong, but let's assume those things for a minute. Okay? Why might their current behavior be making sense? Why are they in this situation? It's not working for them. They're, they're trying to make the best of a bad situation, but they're struggling to find an answer that works. Why might that be? Is it because of the amount of pressure they're under? Is it because they don't feel safe to be able to change their mind? Is it, if we can start thinking, well, why is it making sense for them? What would it make it easier for them to do something differently? Then it's, it stops becoming that adversarial, you need to change, to how can, how can we help you? How can we help each other? And it's difficult because we're all under pressure and we want an answer now. And we're fed up with the status quo. And we're fed up with the frustrations and the inefficiencies and things. But these things take time. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think that, that answer kind of touched on one of my questions was uh, how to inspire people to lead instead of manage. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, and it's it's difficult, isn't it? and, and one of the reasons it's difficult, in my opinion, is because of the. It's tempting, to want to, live in a world, where the right answer, is gettable. And I can learn it, and I can figure it out, and I can do it. But a lot of the organisations that people are in now, reality has changed. What was simple is now complicated. What was complicated is now complex. What was complex is now chaotic. And being able to predict and repeat certain behaviors is no longer appropriate. And that's quite a scary thing to accept for a lot of people. They've got to where they are because of what they know and what they've been able to learn. And now they need to not learn something, know something, but find something out or let something emerge or, or delegate or trust other people. And it's a different behavior to what got them where they are. And at the moment, a lot of these people are clinging on to what they had before because it had worked for them. And they don't know what's in the new world. I did, um, I did some work years and years ago with Craig Larman. My, my, memory's, not, my memory's not great, all right? So I remember little things. Um, I remember that one quote from Esther, and I remember one quote from Craig Larman. He was talking about how years and hundreds of years ago, doctors knew for a fact, for a fact, that if someone was ill, the treatment was leeches. They knew it. It was truth. Okay. Over time, that truth became a little less, a less, little less certain. There were some people that disputed that truth. But traditional doctors. They knew what they, what they knew. They'd been trained. They relied on their treatment, their training. Eventually, those doctors retired and died off, and the new 
generation of doctors who knew something different. They knew about medicine and antibiotics. Things like this. They started filling the profession. And Laman said, it takes a whole generation to die off before the new truth becomes accepted. And he was telling that story in an, in an analogy to a whole generation of managers need to die off. Now, I took that as a little bit dark. <laughs> um, but it was largely said with, uh, with a little bit of humor. Um, there is a bit of truth to that. Um, but I've seen far too many leaders able to change and embrace an agile way of thinking to think actually we need to wait for more to die off. But having said that, the average age of senior leadership teams is getting younger. People who, are, who haven't got the legacy of waterfall, haven't got the legacy of command and control and predicted agile being normal to them. You're seeing more and more of those people <coughs> in boardrooms now. And the more companies like that you get, the more the talent gets attracted to them. Yeah. So you see people, perhaps some of you, thinking, oh, do you know what? It's never going to change again. I'm going to go somewhere else. Somewhere that does have this. <coughs> and that itself puts pressure on those organisations to change because they can't get the talent or they can't keep the talent. What we've got to do Yes, it creates a sense of urgency to change, which might be what it needs. In interesting times. Do you think you will be out of job soon? Do I think I'll be out of job? Yeah. Every day I wake up and think I'm out of job. <laughs> <laughs> um, will I be out of job? No, because people will still be weird. Um, and people will still doubt themselves, and people will still... Some people will not doubt themselves enough. Um, and that's, that's most of my job really, is working with people to help bring whatever traits they've got into balance <coughs> to be successful, whether that's in an agile world, waterfall world, finance world, a tech world, whatever it is. Uh, so I don't think I'll be able to job. And there's all Uber. It's not about how <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I view myself as a professional coach first and an agile coach second. Because uh, agile people are still people. Um, uh, they just operate in a, in a certain domain. Uh, one that I've got a lot of experience in. But actually, I, I quite enjoy people outside of my area, coaching outside of my area of, of expertise. Almost as, uh, perhaps even more so, than coaching people in the area. Where do you see the, the role of the mentor in your coaching world? In our coaching world? Yeah, uh, I'd say. Well, I, 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 think this, I think it's a big one, but I think, like, like I said about leadership, I think I, I didn't put it into very good words, perhaps, but this idea of a leader isn't a role within an organisation, it's, it's, a, it's a skill that we, we all, a discipline that we should all possess and, and execute. And I think the same with mentorship, the best teams that I see, each member of that team is mentoring somebody else in something. Um, leaders take that idea of mentoring rather than managing. Coaching when they can, mentoring when they can. Um, I think that's it's something that it's flatter, whereas mentoring usually or used to be a lot more experience-based and hierarchical. Now you see junior people mentoring senior people because senior people don't have the technology knowledge or the crowd knowledge or the the, 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 the market knowledge or whatever, and it goes in multiple directions. So I think it's a huge aspect in terms of creating cross-functional teams, cross-functional organisations, uh, and redundancy for your teams as well. I don't know, is that, is that what you say? Um, well, I kind of practice 360 yeah. stuff, so I'm constantly unbeknownst to people mentoring them yeah. above. Um, sometimes I do, when they find it. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I'm, I would say part of that modelling change is, is a bit of mentoring in there because that's, that's I say, passive mentoring in that I'm just going to role model. I'm not, I'm not going to say that anybody should do what I'm doing or has to do what I'm doing, but I'm just going to do it because I think it's right. And then other people will notice it. And it's a lot easier to take something that isn't being forced upon you. So I think that's, that's another point. Yes? How do you balance that with having to deliver change by a certain date or a deadline? It's a tough one. I mean, we um, we were given 
Who are we kidding her? It's insane. I remember being in, um, well, I used to work at uh, a national telecoms company. I've got, I've got to be careful now that I'm being filmed. <laughs> <laughs> a national telecoms company. And um, we just found out, we sort of stumbled across the fact that the CEO had made a, a promise to the stock market that we would be 100% agile by September 2007. And we were the team of agile coaches. And we didn't know what 100% agile meant. <laughs> let alone that we had a time frame to deliver it by. But what we found was all sorts of dysfunctional behavior. So when we dug into it, we found that part of the definition of agile was having retrospectives, which on the face of it, you think, well, okay, that's a good thing. Right. Um, but the more retrospectives you had, the higher score you got in your agility measure. So we had teams having retrospectives every week, almost every day, just so they could get more ticks in the box. And they hated the process, they weren't getting anything from it. And you just see games being. Uh, and so part of what the, the opportunity there, I think, uh, it's a bit of a cliche to every problem is an opportunity, but the opportunity there is to talk to leaders who are looking at deadlines for things that aren't predictable and helping them see the cost of that and helping them see the benefits of the alternatives and what would it make what, what would make it safer and more attractive for them to try something different. What are you worried about that's causing you to put this target in place? And seeing there's probably some justified reason behind it. Uh, and more often than not, they're manageable. If you've got that empathy and neutrality and that rapport to have that conversation, then you can have a good conversation. Come on. Yes? Do you think that leadership is based on knowledge and not on hierarchy? No, I think not. Leadership, I personally think leadership is based on humility. And so, well, and to come back to the word knowledge, is being able to accept and openly admit where I don't have the answer, where I don't know. I'm lacking knowledge, but I'm willing to find out. And finding out knowledge is important. Um, it's just my personal view. Uh, I think we live in a very complicated world um, that's getting ever more complicated. And the, the example I often give this is from, a, from an essay from a guy called Leonard Reed. It's called I Pencil, where he tracks the genealogy of a pencil. Um, doesn't sound like the most interesting topic for, for an essay, but it's quite interesting. Uh, well, it is for me. Uh, and what, what I took from that essay is that there isn't one person alive in the world that knows everything you need to know to make a pencil. Which might sound absurd on the face of it, but if you break it down, you, you'll obviously be able to find somebody who knows how to get the wood to make the pencil. They'll know what type of wood makes it. They'll know how to safely chop it down. They'll probably perhaps even know how to shape it into the shape of a pencil. Right. There are probably a few people that can do that. But how many of those people also know how to find, extract, shape the graphite that goes inside it? And how many of those people also know how to find the ingredients and make and apply the paint that goes on the outside? And to find and extract and manufacture and apply a bit of metal that goes around the edge that has a name, but I don't know what it is. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> and the rubber that goes on the end. And the, the stenciling. Right? There's people that can do that stuff, but not one person that can do it all. And that's just a plain pencil. Something we've been using since before we could walk. Right? Well, I think you guys probably, I don't know what you do, but you're probably dealing with something a little bit more complicated than pencils. Now, I would say, just my opinion, that people used to gravitate up the ladder because of knowledge. But now that's not so much the case. It's dealing with a lack of knowledge. I think your ability to deal with that determines how far you get. But I might be wrong. What would you say? I think what you're describing is almost a skill in itself, isn't it? Yeah. The ability to learn quickly has become a key knowledge. Yeah. In order to get the things that you don't know. Yeah. Because they've changed from the past. And part of that comes from our education system in that a lot of kids are taught that there is an answer in the back of the book. And if you don't know what it is, you're an idiot. You can try harder. And you can't copy, and you can't ask for help, because that's cheating. So these 
these people are brought up thinking, I have to be able to find out what the answer is. Me, I have to do that. When actually when they're in the world of work, it's more about getting people who have different areas of knowledge and expertise together and solving a complicated problem through trial and error, more often than not. And yet, treating the fact that I don't know the answer is not a personal slight on me as a person, that's quite a tough thing for people to learn because it hasn't been part of their life. Cool. All right. Was there not another question then? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask you a question about the noodles, actually. Because <laughs> 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 you, you said it, I missed it, which is unfortunate. But um, I can, is, was it to do with your head, or was there a, was there a, a third dimension to the noodles that I first didn't pick up? So the, the old, whole idea of the noodles thing was um, the fact that ramen um, was the, the what do you call it, an acronym for the, for the mall. And it... it <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I took my wife out for, for dinner a while ago and we went to a Japanese place that was quite famous for doing ramen. She'd never been. It said ramen sounded nice. So I said, try the ramen, you'll like it. And she said, what is it? I said, it's just like you know, soup, everything, but with stuff in it, it's nice. And uh, she, she, she says, noodles in it. So yeah, it's a big thing. So that's kind of what makes it ramen, it's noodles in soup. She said, that's a surprise. So every, now we, every time we see ramen now, it's not surprise noodles. Um, so that, obviously that was in my head, <coughs> through this, uh, without even thinking about it. Uh, so no, I, I was, I was going to talk, call it ramen, but uh, so I was a bit bored, Jeff, make it a catchier title, okay? Using noodles to coach for change. Noodles, ramen being a form of noodles. So that's as, that's as, that's as much as it goes. <laughs> that's a fantastic story. It's <laughs> <laughs> very kind of you to say. Uh, but no, thank you for, for coming out on a cold and wet Thursday night. It's Thursday, isn't it? It is Thursday. Uh, and thanks for all watching. Uh, see you again soon. Thank you very much.